Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Teresa Pierno, President and CEO of the National Parks Conservation Association. Teresa has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Teresa, for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you for having me here. So the national parks are dear to our heart. Yes. Talk about the National Parks Association and your role in ensuring that my children and my children's children also are able to enjoy our national parks. Well, our National Parks Conservation Association has been in existence for almost 100 years, and we were actually created by the first director of the National Park Service, and that was Stephen Mathers, because he knew early on that national parks would always be threatened and that we needed a non-governmental, non-profit voice that could really advocate on their behalf outside of government. And so we've been doing that, working to protect the parks for almost 100 year, years now. We come up on our centennial next year. And it's really important because parks belong to all of us. Our national parks and public lands really are a gift and a treasure. And you know, we have a short opportunity to protect them while we're here and then pass them on to our children and grandchildren and make sure that they are still protected and there for the future. Uh, so it's really important that we, we do our job while we're, we're assigned to do that. You know. how, how important are our natural lands and the preservation of our natural lands to American identity? Oh, it's critically important. And of course, you know, many of our national parks are beautiful natural resource lands, some of the most spectacular lands that we have in the country, where we also have a lot of our wildlife. And it really is kind of the last great lands. And a lot of our national parks are also historic and cultural sites and important sites that really tell about the, the United States and our people and, you know, really the history. Uh, some of it is difficult history to remember in challenging times, but it's really important for our democracy. It's important for all of us to have these treasures preserved and protected for the future. Now, there, there is a lot of talk about uh, multi-use of national parks mm -hmm. and adjacent lands. There's a lot of talk about development. Um, there's a lot of talk about if you just extract what's below the ground, it doesn't affect what's above the ground. What is the position of the National Parks Conservation Association on these types of, of issues? Well, it's really a good question because it's really been one of the challenges, particularly with this administration and the threats with oil and gas and extraction. Um, we've worked really hard to make sure that there's a balance. And so, of course, we're going to have oil and gas in some areas on our public lands. But if you do appropriate planning and you look for areas where it makes sense, but there have to be areas where it's off limits. And our national parks have to be off limits. Uh, it's really critical. In fact, if you go to the Grand Canyon now and you look out at the views, or Canyonlands National Park in Utah, you can see for miles unobstructed views. That's what we're trying to continue to protect. Think about how that might differ if you have you know, uranium mining or oil and gas structures and the kind of infrastructure that takes place when you have that kind of development intensified right on the edge of these incredible, magnificent treasures. Would they still be treasures? And in fact, there's one site that has really been the poster child for what we need not to do, and that's Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And so sadly, Theodore Roosevelt, who was such a champion for our national parks, um, you know, here is a site where oil and gas is right up to its borders, and you can see it right from inside the park, and the impact is enormous. So it's the impact on the wildlife, the view shed, the real experience of protecting that wilderness is more than just protecting a postage stamp. You have to really look at that, that ecosystem. I was just at Harriet Tubman um, Visitation Center um, in Cambridge, Maryland, and it, it's an amazing experience, and I had my grandchildren with me, and to be able to walk through that and have them understand and learn and just uh, what an amazing human being, and being able to honor and remember those stories so that we can continue to share them and learn from them, and so that we don't repeat some of those mistakes of the past is really critical. And so parks are really a part of all of us, and it's up to all of us to work to protect them. And so we do everything we can through our, using our tools like our legal tools. Um, and I didn't mention, but sometimes we have to take legal action. Sometimes we have to sue Department of Interior or other you know, aspects of government when they are doing things that are harming our national parks. And so you know, we're not afraid to take the action that's necessary. Well, let's talk about that. You are mm -hmm. an advocate. You, yes. you do not have a neutral position on whether the parks are valuable American assets. 
and you do not have a neutral position on how those parks ought to be stewarded. Talk about how that interacts, for example, with the positions that you take on the legal side. Well, I mean, I take personally very serious um, our historic role and the work that we've done over the years to protect our national parks. Um, and I can tell you just even in the last decade or more that I've been at it um, in leading the organization in these last couple years, we've had to stop things like, you know, working a uranium mine on the edge of Grand Canyon um, or an enormous development that was Tucson that was also planned. Um, or we're talking about like Pebble Mine in Alaska that is an enormous copper and gold mine that is proposed at Lake Clark National Park there that would also have an enormous impact on the salmon run. And this is the place in this world that produces about a third of a wild salmon. And so to you know have, and mines are notoriously uh, polluting, and this is over a wetlands. And so these are the kinds of issues um, that we face all the time. And, and now it's even been more ramped up. Uh, things like Jamestown, historic Jamestown that we all learn about as children and early colonies and you know coming up the James River, Captain John Smith and, and all of that. Here we are now with Virginia Dominion Power putting you know high tension power lines as tall as the Statue of Liberty with lights across the James River in view of Jamestown. I mean how can those things happen? But they happen and if we're not there really working with citizens and really stopping them, whether legally or through our voices, um, we are going to see these parks really destroyed. And they're not going to be there for our children. So they see these areas as an area to be exploited for their purpose, which is not a, a nefarious purpose. It is a profitable, it is a purpose that is driven by profit. But the profit does not actually accrue to the people who live in those areas. Alaska, uh, Alaska Native peoples, uh, citizens of Alaska, do not receive the profit. The profit is exported, but their land, the land in which, right. uh, where they live, people who live around Jamestown, people who live um, around these different areas, they're not really more than the temporary beneficiaries. They might receive a job uh, for a period of time, but, but that does not seem to be the point. Shouldn't these lands also be managed in such a way that, that help the people who live right there? Well, and the ironic thing is, if they're left alone, they do. Because, as I said, parks are an amazing attraction for communities, and, and they have visitors come in, so there are restaurants and hotels. They benefit from jobs and that economy, a very strong economy. Um, just having Jamestown down in Virginia and that colonial parkway and that whole area um, benefits tremendously from the economic benefits. So when you come in with a project that actually impacts you the environment, the experience. You, you actually, right, you diminish the experience, you impact the natural resource, the water, the air, the quality of life, the actual experience itself. Fewer people come, fewer exactly. people attend, fewer people yes. are there to go to the restaurants, fewer people are there to um, to engage in their tourism, um, and the revenue that accrues to small businesses suddenly dries up. And, exactly. and that revenue then gets appropriated by larger businesses, and the communities start to wither. Exactly. And so communities recognize the importance of parks, and they work very hard with us, and, and there are partners on the ground helping to protect um, these places. But you know, many times these decisions are made at a different level, and they're much further away from the actual place. And that's why I think that parks, because it's a system, and because they are so well respected and beloved by Americans and by all of us, really, I mean, so that they really have the potential to be protected more than anything. And I think that's why it's important for young people to visit, to have those connections and experiences, to know what's at stake, to understand what can be lost if we don't go down the road of protection. Um, and so I think for, for the National Park Conservation Association, you know, we, we don't have a, a difficult time deciding you know, what it is that we do every day. We know what we need to do, and we've seen these threats, they come back, they repeat, because anytime money is involved, and a lot of money, um, from some of the extraction and some of these different um, industries, uh, they're gonna keep trying and they're gonna keep trying to you know, make it happen, and it's up to all of us um, to continue to be vigilant um, and continue that fight for our national parks. Environmental conservation has, and the movement, has all very often been um, 
been criticized as being um, a bunch of white folks, uh, not from a particular area, um, deciding that this is how things should be. Uh, talk about your efforts to engage others, people who are of African American descent, uh, Hispanic Latino uh, citizens, and members of different communities to uh, ensure that, that your movement also reflects the rich fabric of America. Absolutely critical. And in fact, we undertook many years ago, and we really were able to focus in this last administration, the fact that um, if you want everybody, right, to be connected and love our national parks and public lands, well, then they have to see their stories, right, being told and honored within the system. And so over the last um, in decade or, or less, we've been able to see and really help and promote and lead the effort for having parks. We talked about Harriet Tubman and Stonewall, Colonel Young, uh, Pullman up in Chicago that tells an incredible right. story, right? So all of those kinds of, and then places like Manzanar that tell um, the internment question, uh, issue and, and really highlight that. So it's really important, and that's why a site like Bears Ears, you know, for the Native Americans, we have to continue to be able to highlight all of these stories. And does your hiring reflect this, the, the connection of people who are involved in these issues and, and those communities' connections to these various yes. national parks? Yes, and at all different levels. We work from a volunteer as well as internship programs. We have a wonderful partnership with Howard University, in fact, um, and universities across the country to bring in young people to work with us and to hopefully then, you know, someday work with us as, as get a full-time job in their career as they move forward. Um, so hiring um, diverse um, individuals is, is critical. We need to be able to have representation from everyone at the table. Where would you like the National Parks Conservation Association to be in five and 10 years? And where would you like the National Parks to be in five and 10 years that is different from where you are today? I think an area that we really need to move forward is the education side. Um, you know, parks, many young people aren't learning about, they're not having the kind of civic lessons that were once taught. And parks play such an important role in the foundation of our democracy, in telling the stories and learning from them. So I would like to see it incorporated more in the education of our young people, and so that it really does become part of the stories that they learn. Because everything you learn about in school, whether it's science, whether it's the, the social and the history, social studies and math and all these things, there are stories. There's, they're highlighted within the national park system. So I think that connection with you know, diverse communities, with young people, and through education is going to be critical. Teresa Pirano, thank you so much for sharing the great work of the National Parks Conservation Association. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.